Monday, April 6th. I'm Rim. And I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we have a bunch of different topics in tech. Let's do this. So this morning, I went to a place I very rarely enter these days. I, uh... I went into the Dunkin' Donuts outside of my work. Oh, that one? The place that's combined that's right next to the TGI Fridays? Yeah, the one that's, that's also... So, that's also, like the tiniest and worst Dunkin' Donuts. The one that is also a KFC that's in the right. same space. Yeah. I went in because, you know, a, there was a big rollout at work, so a bunch of people were showing up early from the sales team and the customer support team, and I'm the morning guy anyway, so I wasn't actually going to show up early. I, I told all them, yeah, I'll be here early. I'll help you out, but I'm always there that early. They, they don't know. So I even said, you know what? And I'll bring in some donuts. So I went in, and usually I stop at like Starbucks, but instead, well, Starbucks I, can't give you donuts in quantity like. Dun- ah, so normally I go to Starbucks and get coffee, but instead I went to Dunkin' Donuts just to get like a bunch of Tim Bits. You know, well, there's gonna be like a million people in that Dunkin' Donuts. No, it's it's seven in the morning. Well, like six forty-five. There's no one there. There was there were like two people in front of me in line, All right. and one guy walked in after. So normally when I stand in line at the Starbucks, I mean, what's the stereotype? of a Starbucks coffee buyer versus like a Dunkin' Donuts or a McDonald's coffee buyer. The Starbucks guy is the one who walks in. They're like, yeah, I want a double soy light latte with that extra this and not enough this and all this sort. They have these really weird In Dunkin' Donuts, orders. you get coffee. It's actually the exact opposite. Every time I go to Starbucks, it's just one after another. People walk up, they're like, tall black coffee or... Latte. Like, they order very simple, quick, specific things. They're prepared immediately. They're not fussy. If they get the wrong thing, they're usually like, eh, whatever, and they just kind of deal with it. Meanwhile, at the Dunkin' Donuts, press A, where it's like an order of magnitude cheaper, like the coffee costs nothing. Mm -hmm. Every single person in that line was giving these outrageous orders like, hey, could you only fill the cup three quarters of the way full and then fill the rest with like half and half, but then at the top put a little bit of vanilla from that thing you got over there and then stir it with one ice cube? Maybe they were like Starbucks-y people, but they were at the Dunkin' Donuts trying no, to... No, 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 because the, the guy says, you know, the usual. <laughs> and the next guy laughed and the clerks talked to him. They go to that Dunkin' Donuts every day. And as I stood there waiting for my donuts, apparently shoveling donuts from the donut dispenser into my bin took longer than getting like 10 people coffee (laughs) every single person in this dunkin donuts ordered like this like everyone had this i I would use the word outrageous order like the the level of fussiness and the level of expectation for their 98 cent coffee there should really just be like you should go in a restaurant and be like you know we don't do anything that isn't on the menu so if you want coffee say coffee you have no you know, you mean like you can tell me, you know, dark or not so dark. You can tell me yes milk or no milk. You can tell <laughs> me, right? But you can't tell me how much. You can't tell me, you know, if you want it, you do it yourself. You know, fuck, we don't do that I shit. I guess just what amazed me was that the stereotype was kind of reversed, that the pe- the people getting the crappy coffee were the most demanding, and the people getting the more expensive coffee were generally eh. less caring. It's all anecdotal anyway. But well, the problem is... It is something that could be studied. It's a weird situation because it is the Dunkin' Donuts on 42nd Street, but at the same time, there are eight Starbucks within a two-minute walk of that place. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, but the thing is, you know, they could be people trying to save money but are also fussy. Yeah. Yeah, but I I have this general feeling. I'm going solely on nothing here. I'm pulling this out of nowhere. I feel like if you did study this, the less, on average, the less people pay for things, the more, not necessarily expectations, but the more demands they may make. And I'll bet it's a cultural thing. I don't know. You gotta... I'm basing this entirely on my experiences at this Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, this one this one morning. Why don't you go to Dunkin' Donuts next to us that's actually nice for a Dunkin' Donuts? Actually, uh, same thing happens at that Dunkin' Donuts if you ever go into it. I never went into it really often, that much. I'll often stop there when I go for a run and grab like a donut just to get some sugar before I go. Hmm. Anyway, that, that that was my morning. That's that, that's what I got. Oh, it's so exciting. Yeah, oh, it's thrilling. Oh, right, do you have any like actual, I guess, technology news of some sort? Oh, I got to go into news a bit. Well, I've realized more and more that in terms of commuting, New Yorkers really have it better than everyone else. Our 
our commuter infrastructure is amazing compared to pretty much everywhere else in America. Forget in America. The, yeah, <laughs> that, that's an important qualification. Forget the rest of the world. We got nothing on them. <laughs> of course, uh, I think we beat those Indian trains. <laughs> yeah, we beat them. What was that video where the people are jumping onto the moving train just to get a seat? Yep. <laughs> but uh, I didn't realize, you know, I've never been to Boston. I'm going to go to Boston for the first time for Anime Boston and then again for PAX East. But I've been to Boston so many times. It's not in a while, but. Yeah, well, I mean, what? I grew up in the Midwest. My vacations were, like, down to Florida or to Cedar we Point. We went to Florida or, also. Or to Chicago, but I, we didn't go out east to those eastern places. The good places? Is it, is it really that good in Boston? Boston's pretty nice. Except... It's also, it's also real colonial. Except... I mean, like, you think it's colonial, like, around here. <laughs> you, you go to Boston. Yeah, but you know what's <laughs> not so nice in Boston? The MTBA. Uh, I'm going to read an excerpt from the beginning of this article because it, it's kind of interesting and... I think this illustrates more than anything why commuter rail or generally a lot of publicly funded things have issues. Quote, it's been documented before that commuter rail service in Massachusetts is among the tardiest in the country, with trains showing up late more than 20% of the time. Hmm. But the official NT MTBA numbers tell only part of the sad commuting story, according to a Globe analysis. The rush hour trains, the ones most people take, are actually late six percent more often than are indicated by the official statistics. Ah, uh, because the other the non rush hour trains show up on time enough. Well, <laughs> so they only look at the total numbers. That's the thing. They it's... should do it by person. Oh, you know, oh, how oh, many oh, people oh, 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 get they, on a late train? That's how you should. should figure it out. But it turns out that they very pointedly and specifically aggregate the numbers from the entire day for their statistics. And in fact, they make a point of not tracking commuter versus non-commuter so that no one can use those statistics to do anything. Mm -hmm. They obfuscate the data. And, and I think what bothers me the most is there's a quote, an official quote from the, one of the guys, like the head of all this and the MTBA. And he says, from a service perspective, I don't want to be saying that one train is more important than another, uh. which either belies his intelligence or proves I think that, that yeah or or more more likely it proves that he realizes that numbers would make him and his department look bad and thus covers them up the most expedient way possible well what they should do is really i mean metro north does the same thing right they just give you the total lateness numbers they don't give you the you know uh times really do but at they at the same time one thing i can point Maybe out they, about, i think they might actually split peak and off peak i don't one remember one thing i can point out about metro north is that in all my years of commuting on it, it's mostly on time. The rush hour trains are pretty much never late. And if anything's late, it's the off peak trains no one cares about. Yeah. Those are the always like is, five minutes late. What they should do is they shouldn't say how many trains are late. They should say how many passengers arrived at their destination late. Well, more That's what they should calculate is what percentage of passengers or when you know what they could do. Here's the most accurate number you could use. Total passenger late minutes. So if I miss, if I'm late for my stop for five minutes and there are a hundred people on that train that adds 500 late minutes, you see, and that's how they should figure it out. Just total late minutes. But no, here's the more important point. Think about this. How come the trains that are used the most are so much more late? There's clearly either the schedules are bad and they because the train has to stop at the station longer. No, no, as no, no, get no, on no, 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 no. That's not the problem. That's, that doesn't even factor into this. If the rush hour trains are consistently that late, what jackass is making the schedules say that they'll make it at these times that they clearly can't make? That's also true. That is the fundamental problem, that they're holding themselves to a standard that they clearly can't make, and then they're making that standard by lying. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is they really... It's, it seems like they haven't actually investigated what the specific causes are because it, it does break down pretty simply. Either it's people getting on and getting off because you see this Metro North trains. It takes like five, sometimes six or seven minutes for the Beacon train to fill out just because everyone's stupid and they all get into the front car. <laughs> yeah, it takes them all this time to just get off the train. You're just sitting there and well, people get off. Yeah, but also maybe there's something to do with, you know, cascade effects. One train is late and then all the other trains don't have any leeway. There could be a million things, but it seems like very trivially if they just tracked this data instead of trying to lie about it or cover it up. But that would require doing actual work. But they're already tracking the trains, but then they aggregate the data and get rid of the specific data. All they would have to do is aggregate... Half that data is like, you know, not even like correctly 
calculated. Well, what's anyway. even worse, uh, apparently their policy, the way it works internally, is that they find the train operator if his train is late and it wasn't due to something he had control or it was due to something he had control over. But when would a train operator ever make a train late on purpose or within their control? I, mean, I guess you could mess up, right? Like you could, you know, mess up going through the signals or, you know, something, something along those lines. You know, you could, you know, not, you could like, you know, not mess up something. I don't know. It seems like that is not the best way to go about fixing this because one, that only encourages people to lie or cover up when they've made a mistake or say if they're late due to an error. Maybe they'll speed to catch up and turn off the safeties because they don't want to get fined. That's also true. That's a ter- I mean, there was even a TED Talk about that. That's the exact wrong way to incentivize people to do their job better. Yeah, that's right. But it's such a simple solution, but I don't think there is any way to force a proper solution Because anyone who's smart enough to manage the trains, right— is this remember this is like a government job this is like a, a job that's all uniony and seniority right and not meritocracy someone who's smart enough to manage the trains is never going to have that job and that job will never pay enough or be pleasant enough for someone who is that smart to ever want that job so there you go the best part is apparently they just had a big rate hike and a lot of that money went into putting in new turnstiles and stuff that don't work as opposed to fixing the trains. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. yeah. At least the MTA, every time they get a bunch of money, suddenly everything gets a lot nicer. I mean, you know, there's a problem with doing a meritocracy as your government. We haven't figured that one out yet. But yeah. there is no problem doing a meritocracy in a place of employment because we have very real rubrics and metrics for measuring someone's job performance in a lot of these jobs. You know, almost no, every actually, job. interestingly enough, because I'm, I'm randomly I've been reading a lot about the Napoleonic era again. I got all these books from when I was going to run this Burning Wheel game that I never got around to. It's so far down in the hopper. <laughs> Shit talking so much. It's in the hopper. <laughs> yeah, it's a deep hopper. <laughs> My hopper is deeper than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> But I was reading this stuff again, and a lot of historians have made the very interesting point that two surprising meritocracies that did exist and did work functionally and properly, to a large degree, were the British Navy during that whole era and the military of France during the early part of the Napoleonic era. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole chapter in one of these books on why these like why these were meritocracies and why they worked and then at the same time why eventually they broke down and were no longer meritocracies but i feel like we could apply a lot of those policies to things we have now well we got to watch out for that why they broke down part yes 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 we also have to watch out for captain laudanum who invariably makes his way in yeah yeah it's a problem (laughs) well i think most of remember those are both militaries which has sort of like the the sort of side factor of People without merit, just there's lots of death. So you just lose lots of people that way. Yeah. Well, like if you're a bad ship captain, either you're going to get court martialed and hung or hanged, I guess is the technical term, or your ship's going to get sunk. I mean, it's not- yeah, it's, it's, you know, but that doesn't really happen so much. I mean, unless you're a really, 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 really bad train operator. Your train's not going to crash. Like the guy who crashed the train because he was busy playing with teenagers and text messaging everyone? Yeah, that's that's super rare. So here's where this gets really interesting. Uh, Archon Fung, and I think that's one of the coolest names I've ever seen. A, quote, political scientist who is part of Harvard's Transparency Policy Project argues that the T and other public organizations should make all of their data available to the public over the Internet in raw form. Of course. So customers can, quote... Well, I guess I'm quoting again. There's a meta quote here. Mash it up. He thinks that in general, if you just take like if instead of aggregating the data and publishing the specific data that, you know, like these are our times and whatever. What if they just made an API and just put out all they're not smart enough to fix a train schedule. You think they're smart enough to make like a cool web API? Here's the thing. They don't even know what that is. No, no, no. Here's the thing. I'm pretty sure if they said sure that Harvard could put together a team of IT people and CS people to make it so in, like, a couple weeks. Yeah, they could do it, but the thing is, they'd need to basically get full access. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to... It'd be be that situation where you're sitting there just waiting for the stupid person to give you what you're asking for, and then they give it to you, and it's not what you asked for. Yeah, but... And you're sitting there waiting for this email, and you're not doing anything. I think it could be done pretty readily, if only politicians could force the MTBA to open up their data. Yeah. It it would take a law 
and be, and, the, and a bunch of grad students. <laughs> it would take a, a lot. Of, there's so much stupidity in the way. But it would, all, all, it would take, all it would take is one law and like ten grad students. Oh yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> a law is a lot to ask for. I know, I know, I know. And but, then you actually think that people are going to execute the law like properly. But I do like the idea, you know, politics aside, that any public organization, unless the data they have is politically like is sensitive in a way that could cause direct harm to people, should just be completely open to oh, anyone's absolutely. examination. It's Even true. if they can't make a web API, I should be able to mail them and pay some nominal pittance and just get it all in text format on like a CD. Well, that's what the FOI is supposed to be for. Except half the time it's all secret anyway. Yeah, it's, you know, and they're trying to work on it, I think, but that it's really, the results so far have been unimpressive. I know. Of course, the thing is, scarily, you know who some of the biggest pushers of the FOIA stuff are? <laughs> UFO people. Of course. And then they always claim it's not working because the government's like, fine, here's the data. We didn't find any stupid I UFOs. I did the UFO, like, you know, FOIA when I was in high school or whatever to get whatever they sent me. Yep. And I read it all, and it was basically a whole bunch of nothing. And there was some stuff blacked out, but it was barely anything. And, like, okay, there was some stuff blacked out, right? If I, if I, anything that could possibly have fit where those words were would not have met their aliens. Actually, remember that there article? There was nothing you could have written that would have made sense in those black spaces that would have, you know, blown the lid off the roof. It was pro most of the stuff was probably like people's names, Remember you know? way back, not not the thing where you could just turn off the redactions in uh, Adobe documents, but that guy who made the statistical yep. analysis program where you could figure out with a reasonable degree of certainty what was redacted just by the context of the sentences. Yep. <laughs> And also, you know, the stuff where it was printed, but then gone over with a marker, they would use a scanner to see it again. Yep, it's pretty trivial, actually. We could do that at home. Yep. You anyway, can actually do it with just like a shiny light and your eyeballs sometimes. Anyway, depending I, think, on the inks. I think this is an interesting article because it raises a lot of issues that are interesting, and it proposes all the solutions we need, but it's one of those things where we know the problem, we know the solution, we have the means to put forth the solution, but it will never happen. Mm. And I, I don't know what to do about it's that. It's the same problem as everything else. But, but again, I don't know what to do about it. You got to kill all the stupid people. <laughs> There's yeah. nothing you can do. I don't think that's a solution either. Well, you know, get rid not killed literally. You know, just get, you know, it's, it's the battle against stupidity. It is never ending and just <laughs> give up. <laughs> so this is, a, this is sort of a sad story, but it sort of got my mind on a tangent, right? Um, you know when you install Adblock Plus, it asks you to shoot to subscribe to a filter? Uh, yeah. And there's different filters for different countries, you know, and such. Huh. And, and you always pick the uh, the easy list, right? Because it's the U.S. one, right? Yes? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, do I have to keep acting you? Yeah. So the uh, the guy who maintained the easy list, he died. Uh-oh. Yeah, well. So, <laughs> you know, that's that's sad. That, that this guy died. Um, and, you know, some people were saying, oh, no, is the easy list still going to be around? Oh, no. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it's going to be fine. Don't don't worry, you know, worry more about the guy dying than worrying about the ad block continuing to work, right? But but that's all people worry about. Right, I mean, right. Riser, but, what did anyone talk about on Slashdot? So what's <laughs> happening to the file system? Right, right. So the thing is that, that I thought was interesting is I started thinking, hey, you know, even Adblock Plus, the greatest ad block system in the world, right? Basically, has a human maintainer. There's a guy who goes out there and finds ads and then comes up with the regular expressions that block them. It's, it's, it's not automatic, you know? Look at, like, blocking ads with, like, a DVR. You're, I mean, sure, sometimes it can sort of, like, go, aha, there was a fade out and a fade in. I'll skip that. But sometimes there's a show with a fade out or in a fade in or a movie or something. And, it, you know, it's or it's not precise. And you need a person to actually fast forward and, you know, or cut the ad out in some video editor to put it on BitTorrent. Or, well, South Park did it pretty well. where They, they did just, by <laughs> accident, yeah. They we, forgot to put the ads into that episode we watched. Yeah, that was, that was pretty good. So, literally, we're watching South Park. Commercial break comes. <laughs> and there's just a minute and 30 seconds of a blank screen. Yep. It was actually kind of pleasant. Yeah, it was like, nice. It, it was a nice intermission. I, yeah. I kind of like that. I tell you, they got to bring intermission back to the movie theaters. But anyway, it, it just, you know, it got me started thinking about, like, how all these ad block systems are still human systems. It's There is no automatic ad blocking, really, so much. It's it's always people, you know, deciding what are ads and what are not ads. And there's really, 
you know, and it's, it's sort of a subjective thing there. And it's also sort of, there's no, no, there's no way it could possibly be done. You know, like what, what could you possibly do to have a, a computer but at the same time? This is almost the same issue as the MBTA thing where by we have, we have people's brains who are very smart and able to do crazy things that computers are nowhere near and won't be for a long time. Crowdsourcing can solve amazing problems in amazing amounts of time. But yeah. at the same time, very few people who like the people who need this the most don't leverage it. So we only get it for things like ad blocking and things where geeks are the ones who care about the problem and geeks are the ones who can implement the solution. Mm -hmm. We never get it for anything else. Because that's why we're just, that's why it's gotten to the point where the geek world is just another world from, you know, because all the things that geeks care about and geeks have control over are basically in the future and everything else is, is really no different than it used to be because, you know, there hasn't been, you know, any sort of geek action there. I mean, look, normal people, Hulu is like this cool thing that they use on their computer to watch some TV with ads, but they still watch cable geeks. Computer hooked up to the TV in a hacked boxy. Yep. They don't like they don't even think about it. Nope. But yet normal people have no access to that. Nope. So what 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 do we do about this? Do we just continue to break away further and further from well, the society around us? Well, what are you, are you gonna go and give up all your geekiness and live slowly? <laughs> I can I can be like that uh, neo primitivist that Emily knew in college. Yeah, you're gonna be like that. <laughs> the guy who get, he got rid of all his furniture in his dorm room, but he had clothes and he kept his uh, MacBook. Yeah, because he had to blog about his uh, neo primitivist lifestyle. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, I I wonder. If maybe we should, I feel like some speculation is due as to what problems this schism is going to cause ten years from now. Ten years from now, I mean, 10 it's the years same problems you have now, only worse. Because what's going to happen is, you know, you're already seeing it. Now it's the situation of, oh no, the newspapers are going out of business. What's the normal person going to do who doesn't know how to use a computer? And it's like, you know, you had your transition period. It's been over a decade since the internets. You've had a long time to get, you know, to move ahead. If you still haven't moved ahead, there's not a newspaper anymore. You have no choice. If you don't like ebooks, you know, or computers. No, I think it's going to be reading far, on a screen. I think it's going to be far more sinister than that. Because mm -hmm. as long as there are people who can't use these technologies, there will be a market in catering to them. But at the same time, these are the people who will just by the nature of the media they consume and the way they consume it will have the least control over what they get. So they'll be more and more scarily controlled by the very people who use the technology to give them their information in their old methods. Yeah, but their numbers will be so small that they won't be able to do anything. It'll just be a very, you know, they'll be st the crazies. Will they really, though? How small will they be? I mean... I don't know. Big at first and then decreasing over time. But at the same time, I don't know if the percentage... And they'll also mostly be old people who go away, you know, the first ones to because go. Because for every 4chan kid, there are still 10 kids who don't really use the internet and still They don't read like... newspapers either. They don't read. Yeah, but... <laughs> kids don't read. We have to worry the old people are the ones you have to worry about. <laughs> they read. No, I'm, no, I'm more worried about the kids. Well, that kids not reading is, is a different problem than old people reading paper. But I think it's, get, it's getting to the point more and more where I have very little ways to communicate with the people around me. Like, in my neighborhood, I would have almost no way to communicate with anyone in my neighborhood. Like, I, if I found their first and last name, I'd have to go find a phone book, I guess. Yeah. yeah. You or can like, use Google phone book. Yeah, but that doesn't always work so well. Maybe I could just shout into the street. I mean, going to someone's door and knocking on it, it's like the olden days you could do that. Nowadays, you can't do that so much. I guess you could, but... I have not knocked on a stranger's door in almost a decade. Yeah, I mean, you, you know. Well, no, no, one, not that long ago, I knocked on the wrong door. People will think you're a Jehovah's Witness or something, you know. You only knock on a door if you have actual business. Hey, you know, like, well, I'm I the UPS guy, or I'm, uh, I'm coming to fix your water heater, or I'm your friend, or, you know, you know, a stranger knocking on the door to talk about something that, A, is not a business transaction, and B, is not a sales pitch from a religious person. That, that's, Basically, you know, that, knocking on my door is the equivalent of pinging my secure ports. It's like, what are you doing? Why are you trying? That, that port's not for you. Yeah, it's... 
<laughs> so it's like <laughs> you, there's an API right there. See that mailbox? I mean, maybe we could. You know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it just, you know, it's not. It's what not. It, it's not what it used to be. It's, this old gray mare. Yeah. It's a, you know, like remember that Hitchcock we were watching, where those two guys just walk into the guy's house and hang out in his living room, waiting for him to come home. Yeah, that used to be totally cool. I'd like to live in a place where that was totally cool, but that's not the way it is. But I think the schism, like even at my work, like I work in an incredibly high-powered IT and CS environment. Like, I really honestly think I work in one of the most technologically proficient companies in America. Like, <laughs> I, I don't want to brag, but, the, like, people are smart to the point that I often feel very dumb and very inadequate at the place I work. And for someone with my ego, I think that says something. And yet, at the same time, there was a conversation today at one of our big meetings. I am the only person possibly in the company who uses Twitter at all. And I barely use it because I'm a curmudgeon. <laughs> Think about that. And so you're not working at a very high-powered, technologically advanced place. I, I think I am, though. No, nah, but no one uses Twitter. <laughs> Compare yourself to the company where everyone uses Twitter already. There you go. You got. But beat. at the same time, what are they doing? What kind of big iron do they have running? There are places that you all use Twitter and have big iron. Dig? I, Dig's got big iron. Do you even know what big iron means? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I got to, I got a good thing of the day here. I found this out of nowhere. Like it was funny. Oh shit! I forgot my thing of the day. What was yeah, it? Yeah, but I'll talk about mine, and maybe you'll remember yours. Uh... But uh, out of the blue, we were talking about peeing because I think I had a I had a particularly long uh, pee session the other day to the point that it woke Scott up in his room. So you know, he comes to me the next day and he's like, "Ram, that was quite a pee ahead this morning. You shouldn't pee that loud." And then my response, as I often do, I kind of respond in the real world the way I would respond to someone if I were on FARC, is I just went to my computer, went on YouTube, and searched for that scene from uh, A League of Their Own where Tom Hanks just pees forever. And I found it. But then there were all these other scenes. And I realized that this video was a collection of all the times Tom Hanks has had an extended peeing scene in a movie. And you know what? There are a lot of them, like a surprising number. Tom Hanks is now typecast as the guy what pees on screen for longer than is comfortable. Yeah. I mean, A League of Their Own, uh, The Green Mile, Apollo 13, uh, the Castaway movie. Uh, there were like four more. It was crazy. He does a lot of peeing. I mean, if I need, <laughs> if I'm making a movie, which I'm probably never going to do really, but, uh, and I need someone to pee, I know who to call. <laughs> I think A League of Their Own has the longest one. but <laughs> Yeah. So I forgot my thing of the day, but uh, I, I remembered an alternative thing of the day, so I don't have to get up and pause the show. All right. So uh, you know that there's a, there's a web comic that's pretty old and actually hasn't been updated in a long time called Shabbat 6000. Oh, I love Shabbat. S-H-A-B-O-T dot com. Uh, 6000 dot com. You get a link to that flash of uh, the one... I forget what holiday it is. Well, he's got a few flashes. But anyway, um, basically, it's a funny comic where you have a, a robot living with a rabbi, and the, and the robot learns about Jewishness. <laughs> and he's always being, like, uh, uh, you know, misbehaving in a, in a, you know, at least Jewish misbehaving. You know, he's like, you know, on Yom Kippur, you know, to help me get through the fast, you know, sometimes I eat a little. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um... Uh, that guy apparently a year ago made this video, uh, 20 things to do with matzah. And that thing sort of became popular on the internet this year. <laughs> it took a year, you know, to the next Passover. So it's a fun video of this guy and a girl singing a song about 20 things to do with matzah. And Passover is, uh, Wednesday. So it's relevant. And there's another flash video where, uh, they, it's a, it's a, the rabbi, the robot, and uh, Fifty Cent are uh, rapping about the ten plays. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a good one too. All right, all right. So, uh, what were we doing this show on? I don't know. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff. You got it all written down. <laughs> uh, some of it. I mean, basically, what happened was is people started giving us ideas for the show, and all of the ideas either a required preparation, right? And the problem with a preparation show is not that. We have to do preparation because we have time to do some preparation. Preparation. 
is that if we do a show about something we don't know about, like, and have ex- actual experience with, then our preparation consists of internet research, and the show becomes read Wikipedia, uh, or effectively read Wikipedia, in which case, what's the point of us doing a show, right? If we're going to do a show, it's either it's because we have personal experience with something, and we can provide knowledge or insight that is not available on the internets already with your Google searches, right? Uh, so the other problem is sometimes we get a show topic, but the show topic is so minimal that it would only be like five minutes of talking and that's it. You know, oh, we talked about it and we're, well, we're done. There's, there's nothing else to say about that topic. So that we can't really use that for a show because we need like 20 minutes at least of talking. So we decided, hey, what if we combine a bunch of those five minute shows into a 20 minute show? And uh, that might work. So it's not a tech news roundup. It's like a tech show roundup. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to do you want to try I, this? I'll, I'll kick it right off with with a short one because I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we had our live stream and it went really well. The audio for that will be up this Thursday because we're gonna try to do a full week of shows this week. Try because you know Scott's going out of town Wednesday and stuff, but I'll probably put a bu- there'll be a bunch of extra stuff up in the feed this week. But you know we recorded this and we did it on UStream and things were going fine, and then a little way through, suddenly the shit cockery began suddenly and like a lot more than I would have expected. For- well, I think what it, it really started happening, I mean, you know, there were some people who were sort of, you know, Geek Nights fans or a little bit shit cocky, you know, but they were, you know, sort of relevantly shit cocky. But then we but, got featured on the front page of yeah, Ustream. If you get enough people in your channel, you'll get to the front page of Ustream and then random people who just come to Ustream.tv will click on you or just get thrown into your channel, you know? So... You get those people, and those people, they're, they're shit cockers. Now, I have to preface this because, I mean, we're both technological people. Scott and I are both aware fully of the nature of the legion yeah. of, like, the hordes of the internet. The John fact that- Gabriel's internet fuckwad theory is not news to us. Yes. We have been playing the, you know, the FPS is on the internet for, since, you know, last century, millennium. I mean, I remember when I would play Quake 1, I would log on to a server and I would be killed by a man named Fuck Jesus who was saying your mother repeatedly in the chat faster than he was shooting me. And then would, you know, after he killed everyone on the map, would go to your corpse and crouch many times. Oh, man, good times. <laughs> and then he would draw a giant penis and then, you know, who knows what else would happen. Or like, you know, look at YouTube Or I'd go comments. into an AOL chat room and someone would put in an ASCII art of like naked something and then just, just be like, fuck, fuck, motherfuck. I mean, or the, the idea that it's kind of like in a, in a city, if there's any space where you can write something on it and no one can stop you, the word fuck appears. Yeah, and it's anonymous. <laughs> yeah, or, or at least... Well, I mean, you know, we know the theory. Anonymity plus, you know, audience, audience equals shit cock, right? Yep. But, uh, or YouTube comments, they're just, they're a place people can scribble, so they scribble horrifying things. And I knew this. I knew this on an intellectual level. I knew it on a practical level. I used filters like Slashdot and Fark in places to where I don't interact with these things. It's just noise. It's no more than static to me. Like, I don't even recognize yeah. it. I just... I mean, sometimes you encounter it, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get through. Because, you you know, we know it's there. We know there's a problem and we know how to deal with it. We've dealt with it for a decade yep. at least. I mean, the internet is the Wild West and I carry a gun and I shoot anyone who looks at me cross-eyed. Yep. But I guess... I didn't really know it on a visceral level. It's one of those things where you knew it, but at the same time, you didn't really. Because suddenly, like... the, the Like, imagine if you had just had... You lived in a coastal town, and you had a bat... You were in, like, New Orleans. You actually had a real levee that worked. And you just, after a century, you forgot that there were floods, and then the levee broke. Uh, the, the rapidity with which... The, 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 not just the rapidity, the rapidity and the numerousness of the people who came into this chat room spouting the most vile garbage imaginable at the drop of a hat, too. Like, there is no explanation other than the fact that they went to Ustream continuously. There was a sea of people constantly hitting the front page of Ustream, being immediately directed into whatever was featured there, no matter what it was, with just everything ready to go. Like they were, it, it, it gets to the point where it's a matter of premeditation. It's not like someone just sees a message board and thinks, "Hey, hey, hey," and they go in and type, "Shit, fuck, 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 shit, 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 fuck." And it was that these people are like going to these sites with the specific intent of doing this. See, I don't know if it's intent, right? I think what it is is a box to type in. 
and they got to type in something, right? And basically, the their their minds are just so shit cock that that's just that's just what just sort of comes out. It's completely unthinking. It's completely. But think about it's this. as reflexive as a drunken guy going woo. But think of this. It's just within, the chat room. It's like oh fuck fuck fuck. Within ding, like ding, ding, ding. ten seconds of us being on the front page, like. 10, 15 of these people just start appearing one by one, spouting it off. That means that for no matter what, as long as anything is on the front page of that, there is a constant stream of people being directed into it, saying these things. There is a constant stream of people constantly trying to get into places to shitcock. I, I, I wonder, I want to write like a treatise on this. I want to figure out really why. We know what. We don't really know why. Yeah, we don't know why in a psychology sense. I mean, there should be like an actual book about it. I mean, we know we have so far we have a web comic that explains it really well, but we don't know the real brain workings because I'll admit, and societal workings that and, result in this. And you'll admit too, you feel that urge. Everyone feels it every now and then. That little that little tinge is kind of like you're walking down the street and you see like a. Someone drops their wallet and you think for a second, I could just grab it. And you don't, you don't, you, like, you don't even consider grabbing it. But part of your brain says you could and star already started weighing the odds of getting away with it, but you don't do it. You're a good person. You don't even think about it. But on the internet with things like this, really, I don't really think about taking the wallet as much as I think about like, should I ignore it or should I give it back? I don't even <laughs> think, I don't even think, should I take it? It's should no, I ignore it or should I give it back? I don't think, me? should I take it? But there's definitely that that the part of the brain I think is always calculating whether or not you can get away with things. But on the internet, there's no moral ambiguity because you're not, you're not, all you're doing is saying something. You're not doing anything. And I'll admit when I was in that, uh, the anonymous, you know, chat with a stranger and Scott was over my shoulder and we're in there and we're typing and I talked to the stranger. I typed two lines and I immediately feel this slight urge to just type your mom. I don't have that. Oh, well, your mom has sort of just become a reflexive say yes, for yes, a lot of yes. things. So, but it wasn't it wasn't a shit cocking urge. I don't really have that. But is issue. it your mom is still a, a lesser degree of shit cocking? I don't know. A talking to a stranger. Hi, how are you? Your mom. Well, that you know the content of it, but with knowing that who we are, it's not. Maybe maybe if we knew who those people were, maybe their shit cocking is actually the same way your mom is for us. Is it really, though? Would, you, would I join a chat with you and type a racial slur hundreds of times per second until you banned me? No. <laughs> Only to come in with a different name and type a different racial slur? But I mean, like, uh, you know, I used to hang out with some Jews back in the day, and we'd be like, what up, my kikes? Yo! And it would be, you know, it was a funny thing. But if you said that to someone else, it'd be like, oh, shit. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, but like, if I say it online, like I go into a chat room and I'm like, you know, a Jewish chat room, I'm like, what up, my kikes? It would be like shit cocking. But if they would have known me and known our friends and had the context, it wouldn't have been shit cocking. So there is, I think, I'm not going to say that, you know, all shit cocking is just out of context, non shit cocking. But what I will say is I think there is a portion of shit cocking of people who have things that they say in the context of their friends and closer social groups uh, sit, that are bringing those things, you know, sort of out of bounds. You know, they're taking their in jokes, taking them out into the chat rooms of public world where they are taken out of context and thus viewed as shit cocking. And that is a portion of shit cocking, perhaps a very small portion, but, but it is but it is there. It does exist. But at least in those cases, it's still there there's an expectation of communication. Yeah, it's not a hundred racial slurs in a flood. It's like one liner. Plus, even then, there's an expectation of a response. Notice how I think that the real line between shitcock and not not in shitcock specifically is whether or not you actually expect a response. Yeah, because flamers expect a resp uh, a response, you know. Trolls expect a response. Shitcockers are just Putting bad words in a in a flood, and that's it. They, they don't expect a response. They're not going to talk to you. They're just spitting out lots of bad words. Maybe I wonder. Some of it is is definitely like you know the same way as like the little kid who's not allowed to say bad words. It's like oh my god, I can say bad words. But there are so many of them, and there are so many other places they could do this. The fact that they're doing it everywhere simultaneously in real time, twenty four seven, all the time. I don't know what they're doing it twenty four seven. I think that we have to try this. We have if we did a Geek Nights you stream. Or, and got enough people in on Christmas no, Day. No, it's the same person all day. I mean, it's a rotating. No, I'm saying that 
at any second there is like, in any public space that is big enough to warrant notice there are people trying to shitcock there mm. kind of like how on the internet if you have a cable modem and no net someone is hitting all your ports all the time yep except on the internet you know literally it's just people typing fuck at all your ports all the time right all <laughs> right so moving on oh so let's you want to talk about uh, i had this problem today right what I wanted to do is I'm on Ustream, right? And I'm, I'm sitting there and I want to teach some people some computer stuff, right? So what could I do? I could point my webcam at my screen. Not good. I could get a big whiteboard, but Rim didn't order it yet, right? Yeah, I got a big uh, Amazon order in the queue. I could, or I could go and find something that would basically take my screen and stream what's on my screen, right? And WebEx. Huh? WebEx does it really well. Well, but see, the thing is... That's a commercial product, though. Yeah, it's a commercial product, right? There's something else. Webcam Max, also a commercial product. There are a bunch of free ones. They all suck. There are some that do it, like, you know, a go-to meeting or something like... Or like a VNC kind of thing, you know? The problem with those is that they're not, you know... They're not like web-based video streams like YouTube, like Ustream. They're like, you know, you connect to my computer kind of you know, remote desktop things. It's completely different. And really, there wasn't a solution. There just, there just wasn't. Like, everything out there, like, there were some, some almost solutions, but everything was poop. There was, like, no way to take what was on my screen, stream it over streaming video in a web page, a la Ustream, with good enough resolution for people to see what was in my terminal, right? And have it be really accessible to the viewer so that lots of people could watch but also have the communication mechanisms integrated, you know, the chat room and me talking to them and the whole, right? It's like, I could have done this separate from the Ustream, but then people would have joined the Ustream and then also join that and also get a piece of software. It was like so much work, you know, just to make this happen where it should have been really easy. And I think the best solution that I came up with was get a webcam, bust it open, take out the camera. Get some sort of device that has a VGA cable in one end and then connects to the camera spot on the webcam on the other end. So it's basically VGA to USB. So you have it coming out of your video card into a device into your USB hole, and thus it your computer treats, um, you know, you duplicate the monitors using clone, and then your computer would think the second monitor was also a webcam and would thus be able to stream it. Yeah, I but, couldn't find anything better than that. See, now I feel like the the market here right now in the short term, if Ustream just had an option to share a desktop, they do. But it's it's it, you have to get the stupid program that costs money. If Ustream could just do it without doing that, yeah. The problem is on Windows, right? Because the way Windows works, the only well, no, way- that, that what I was about to say is that if you just share it as video, that's still that's a lot of bandwidth, and it's going to be really lossy and terrible compared to doing it. You know, like with the MSTC. Exactly. But MSTC is not set up by default to, like, you can't just use that through something like Ustream. Yep. I don't know. And X forwarding. <laughs> no, 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 it's not going to happen. But yeah, it's like the way to do it, right, with the video part is you have to basically put a driver in Windows in between, you know, like the mod. It has to be a webcam driver that picks up on, you know, the video out. And that's totally the wrong way to do it. But because of the architecture of Windows, that's the way it has to be done. You know? There was something called like Webcam Studio for Linux. I couldn't even get it to work on Ubuntu. It just didn't install. I didn't, yeah, well, I, I didn't have time for that shit. I there were a problem. lot of solutions that required a lot of work, and I wasn't about to deal with them. I had that problem just looking for a screen scraper for my own desktop just to make some... Uh, way back, I oh, was going to make... There's plenty of solutions to record your desktop. Oh, there are, but even then... In Linux, many of them either don't work or are really shitty. Well, XVidCap is, is fine. It's okay, but... You just, the thing is, you have to do the encoding yourself afterwards. It makes a gigantic full-res AVI. Yeah. You know, but That's at least it I... doesn't destroy your performance like some of the other ones do, That because they encode while they're going along. So it's like your performance goes to shit and you can't work. Yeah, of course, I got two cores. I could live with that, but nah, XVidCap worked pretty well, but it wasn't optimal. It was just yeah. the best one. And it doesn't, uh, XVidCap also, right? It might record the, the, your screen. It doesn't record the audio, so you have, to do, you have to dub it later. 
Yeah, or I, I mean, I or guess you I could... push record and Audacity at the same time. Yeah, but that's, that's still it gets out of sync. You're gonna have trouble. Yeah, you need to re- you need to record that vi- audio, dub it in a program that also takes the video into account, so the dubbing is you know timed properly. Maybe our answer is just to have a big whiteboard and a camera. Yeah, but I also think having a computer where the VGA cable goes into you know like a capture card or something would also uh, be, uh, like, the correct solution that would work properly, you know? It still, it just, it really sucks, because you shouldn't need hardware to do it, but I think we do. Uh, all right. All right, you got more? I, I only mm. remember the one I brought up, so. Uh, okay. Uh, someone wanted us to do a show about regular expressions, and I was sort of like, you know, why should we do a show on regular expressions? I mean, first of all, regular expressions are a very visual thing. If you're going to teach them to someone, you need, like, terminals and things you know open and text editors that you can you know visually show what's all about and also everything i've learned about regular expressions i've learned from the internet so this is also a web this one website you'll know if you find it it's very high up on google if you do searches for regular expressions it's sort of orangish and uh, yep I've, I've used that because that I'll website often... has really pretty much everything you need to know yeah because even you know i use i use them on a daily basis constantly but every now all and the then, time I'll forget some obscure syntax, or I'll I'll try to think of a like I do something, but it's kind of inefficient. I pretty much need them as a, need like a reference all the time because I don't remember hardly any of the syntax. I remember all the or stuff like I I'll use. come up with a regular expression, but I'll need I'll hate it because it's not perfectly <laughs> optimal. So I'll have to go search around to like get it optimized. Yep. Or half the time I'll end up I'll use like a regex that gets the job half done, and then my output gets pipe set aux something to get my real output. Or grep pipe, grep and pipe, grep when I could have done it with one red egg, regex. Yep, just because you're not that good with the regex. You're not a regex wizard. You just yeah. sort of know enough to get them to go. And few people are. Few people are indeed. Mostly Perl people are regex wizards. Yep, I mean, I stare at command lines all day. All I do is parse logs into other logs and track stuff through logs. And I use regexes constantly, like, I don't know. About 50 an hour, maybe? I'm trying to come up with a metric. I mean, Django is in, you know, you're doing web stuff. URL is all about URLs, parsing URLs, and verifying form fields. It's all regular expressions. But for, for the layman, if you're wondering what we're talking about, if you, a regular expression is a way to, is a syntactical way to parse text and generate an output that is transformed based on your rules. So you can search right. through text find what you're looking for in a very specific right. ordered way. So so there's two parts. There's the matching, right, of text, and there's also the parsing of text, right? So the matching goes something like this. Let's say I have a regular expression that is like, you know, um, I, you know, I... It, I'm not going to actually speak in the syntax of regular expressions because that won't, it'll just confuse the hell out of That'll you. That'll sound like a DCSS. But let's say, right let's say I'm looking for bracket. a phone number, right? I'm looking for a phone number. I want to know if what the person typed in is a phone number. So we've, I say three digits followed by a hyphen, followed by three digits, followed by a hyphen, followed by four digits, right? So there's a language where I can type in. It would be something like, you know, uh, backslash D curly brace three hyphen backslash D curly brace three hyphen backslash D curly brace four, right? And what that would say is three digits followed by hyphen, followed by, right? So then I can tell the computer, here's my regular expression, the shit with all the curly braces. Here's, a, here's the, per- the thing the person typed in. Does it match? And if the person typed in a phone number, meaning three digits followed by a hyphen and so on, it'll give me a yes, thumbs up. And if what they typed in has like letters in it or has four digits followed by three digits followed by a slash, it'll say thumbs down. So that's the first thing you can do with regular expressions is you say, does this match? Thus, you can take some unknown input that is text, right, or numbers and symbols, and determine if it matches this format that you're looking for. Now, right? to it, just, just to give you an idea of how powerful this is, just on this front part, you could trivially write a rule that also, you know, it, it could look for this. Three digits that may or may not be surrounded by parentheses, followed by either a space or a hyphen, or the parentheses from before, and then four digits, and then, or, or actually, and then three more digits, and then four digits, with or without that whole first section. So you could... Find out, like, you could look for almost any format someone could type a phone number in. Yeah, go online and look for something. Go do searches for, like, 
email address regular expressions and they'll people will have all these different crazy regular expressions that match like they match anything that could possibly be an email address and don't match things that are not email addresses and it, it gets pretty crazy but it's it's ridiculously powerful and it you know it has lots and lots of applications like i said let's say you're making a website and you have people typing things into the boxes on the website and you want to make sure that what they typed in is correct you could use a regular expression. Let's say you've got a big file full of, I don't know, uh, like, like data, right? And you want to look, and it's just a text file. It's not in a nice spreadsheet or anything. And you want to look for people who live in New York. So you can, you know, do a regular expression looking for NY, capital, with spaces around it, you know, or you know, all sorts of, you know, different combinations of things that, that will result in that being, a, you know, and you could say, give me any line in this file. This is what grep, the program grep does. You could be like, give me any line in this file where you see the letters NY. And it will only spit out those lines in the file and not spit out the other lines. Yep. And they're great for looking through log files. You know, I want to see every message that was sent to or from this list of three clients that involves a timeout on this thing. Yeah, I've got this big old file full of all the logs, everything that the web server has done for the past hour. Give me every line in this file that has the word error in it so I can just see the errors. Or you can use them programmatically for things like log channels. Like say you write complex programs or daemons. So say you have every log line start with an integer from one to nine and then a space and then the line. So you could designate say that uh, channel one is major errors, channel two is minor errors, channel four is debug, channel nine is like infra events no one cares about. And you can have a, a log masker that uses regular expressions that will basically say, if the log line I'm about to write is in channel four, you know, it begins with an integer four, then write it. Otherwise, don't unless I change the log mask. Yep. So there are lots and lots of ways to just use the matching capabilities of regular expressions. We haven't even scratched the surface on that, right? I mean, if you use something like awk, you're, you're going way. You can, it's crazy powerful. Crazy powerful. But... You think that's powerful. Regular expressions have one other function, and that is the, you know, the parsing uh, functionality. So what you can do is you can say, let's say I'm doing, I'll use the phone number again, right? So I'm doing the phone number, and the phone number has, you know, that area code at the beginning, right? So I can say, match a phone number. Three digits followed by whatever, followed by three digits, followed by four, right, four digits. But I put some parentheses around those first three digits. Now, I can say... All right, look at this whole big file. Find anything that matches a phone number. And then spit out just the just the area code part. Give me that area code part. So you can extract parts of what you have matched, right? So like I could match uh, email addresses and I can just pull out just the domain part. You know, I could be like, just give me all the domains. And I could say like, how many yahoo.com email addresses are in here? How many gmail.com email addresses are in here? You know, um, I could go in and you could, you know, so by pulling out different parts, you can actually start to do some really crazy stuff. Like I have a script I wrote that will rename, you know, you download an anime fan sub, right? And the file name is this crazy fucked up thing, right? You've got, and people do it all different ways, you know? And they've got, they put in like the name of the fan subber in there. You got the episode number in there. You got the file extension in there, right? You got all this junk in there. So I'll wrote this program that basically it checks to see if, you know, this, you know, file, it looks at all the file names in the folder and it says, does this file name match, you know, is it, a anime fan sub all right so it mostly looks for like an mkv or avi file extension right then it says if it is extract out right the name of the show and extract out the episode number right get rid of the rest of the shit and rename it to name of show space hyphen space episode number dot file extension you could even really set it up to where if you can't parse it properly like you can set up the expression to where if it doesn't fit any of your cases, flag it with like, you know, four X's at the beginning. And then I'll go through and sort those manually. Yeah, you can, you know, and then I can, you know, once I see that that case didn't match, I can then go back and modify my regular expression to match that case in the future. So, you know, it, it's the regular expressions are, you know, an evolving thing sometimes when you don't have, 
you know, consistency. It's like when you have some consistently structured textual data, they're very useful because you can process large quantities very easily and very reliably. But when you have small amounts of inconsistent data or even large amounts of inconsistent data, they're equally powerful because it's the, the only thing you can do to search inconsistent data is a regular expression. There's no way to search something that's all fucked up, you know, with an, with an actual search function because, you know, something that's more straightforward because you're not going to find anything. And that's that's what regular expressions are all about. And if you have to deal, you know, with text or matching or searching or finding and replacing or renaming or verifying or anything along those lines, you know, in computers, regular expressions are something you should learn. And I think as you know, there really isn't going to be a replacement for them. They're pretty much it, you know, and they're going to be it for quite a long time. I mean, we'll still be using regular expressions probably 10 if not 20 years from now that there's really nothing else we can do about we it. We will be using them until we have semantic computing. Yeah, pretty much. So it's worth your while to learn them and to learn how to use them and to learn to write simple scripty programs that utilize them because that you know learn, you know there are two the main things you have to learn, you know you can learn sed, which is like this straightforward regular expression tool. Yeah, you well can learn awk, which is a super powerful regular expression tool. You can and you can learn you know, simple way to remember. Sed is a, is a stream editor, so you can basically take a file, pipe it into Sed, and then the output will be transformed by whatever expression you build. So you could say, replace the letter A with the letter F on every file on my hard drive. Yep, Sed can do that, right? Awk is basically you put something into Awk and you give Awk a bunch of expressions, and you say Awk, whenever you see this expression, do this. So it can go through a file or whatever you give to it, and whenever it sees a certain expression that it's looking for, it does something, right? So you, that's in ridiculously powerful once you learn how to use it. You can use grep, which is pretty much search for something. So you got a folder full of files, and you want to look you know, through those files. Let's say you're working on a program, and there's a function called foobar, and you don't know which file the foobar function is in. Well, grep is the winner. And lastly, you know, in your programming language of choice, Python, Ruby, Perl, Bash, whatever, you can learn how to use the regular expression tools provided by that programming language to write full-on programs that can use regular expressions for searching, replacing, verifying, matching, whatever. PHP, whatever. It's all good. All right, we, we've actually gone on pretty well. Maybe we can end there. You don't want to do another one, or that's it? It's been a while. I think we can stop for now. I think, I think it was a good proof of concept, and it uh, killed a Monday. All right. Monday All right. did. Yes. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>